All right, as usual, the introduction is probably going to be better than the talk, but we'll give it, we'll give it a try. What I wanted to talk to you about today, though, is something that's near and dear to my heart, and hopefully yours, because this is the first time I've addressed an organization like this at Penn. Typically, the organizations I speak to are they're at universities that end with something or other A and M. Those are very natural schools to attract people into the oil and gas industry. And we've been on a journey since I started at Halliburton to change the, the entire makeup of the people who create innovations for oil and gas. So as Kate said, um, when I came in, we uh, changed all the leadership for every business unit in Halliburton over the course of four or five years. And none of the people that came in to those leadership jobs were from oil and gas or from an oil and gas university. And over the course from 2010 to 2014, we hired about 2,000 people. And the population was 70% masters and PhD, which is very unusual for our business, for our com company, which had been dominated by bachelor's degrees. And of the same percentage, just by coincidence, were people hired from other industries. So 70% of our population, the new population we just brought in, came from not oil and gas, either as an incumbent from another company or from a typical traditional university. And the oil and gas universities, think of it, it's really simple. Start in Houston, go 200 miles east and west, and draw a line from Mexico to Canada, and that's oil and gas. So we decided to go coastal and hired people from other places. It was unheard of to hire somebody from MIT or Princeton or Penn. So as we did that, there were a lot of, there were a lot of uh, people who thought this would be the end of our company. And uh, I'll tell you, one of the results that we got is that innovation went up. We put people from other fields into oil and gas and said, figure out these problems for us and we shall be better off. And there was a lot of disbelief. But when I joined the company, we got 193 patents in my first year. And last year, we got 813 patents. This year, we're going to be almost at 900. So Halliburton is the 44th most prolific patenting company in the world, the only oil and gas entity in the top 50. So I guess what I'd like to say to you, I'll give you the punchline. It's a very interesting place for people who don't have anything to do with oil and gas to come, learn, and contribute. And I want to talk to you about some of the aspects and some of the things that we've done. So first, I wanted to make an obligatory, I had to make this sort of obligatory chart um, because I know I'm, I'm on a coastal city now. So in Houston, I'm in a different kind of a coastal city. Um, oil and gas is someday not going to be our dominant energy source. That's pretty clear. I worked for an alternative energy company, and it's a very long putt. So what you see here is the, our government's prediction of the use of hydrocarbons and alternative energies over the next, when's it go, till 2050? Over the next 30 years. And as, as it's predicted now, because of the known science for alternative energy and the capital costs associated with it, it looks like hydrocarbons will be our energy source for a pretty long time. Given that, we have to be efficient, we have to be environmentally sound, we have to be cost effective, and we have to be safe for the humans that work in the industry. Because it's a long time before alternative energies will likely take over. And the four things that keep me awake at night as we start to think about at least the next 30, 32 years to 2050, and that chart didn't actually show a peak in hydrocarbon usage, are these, these four problems. And I'll talk to them in turn. Everybody talks about digitization. You can read about it in, even in the New York Times every single day. Um, it's not clear what it is, so I'm going to try to put a little finer point on it for you, what I think digitization is. We have to understand uh, the rocks. So if you want to think about drilling for oil, which is what my company does, 
Um, you start on this surface and you drill a hole, say two miles deep, maybe three miles deep, and then you take a left turn at the first stop sign and you go two or three miles sideways. So you've drilled maybe six miles. You've drilled six miles with a machine for which you have no way to see where you are. Well, we, we have certain ways, but you don't exactly know where you are and where, what you're in. It's, it's not a very clear way to do this. And we don't always know what rocks we're going to be in because the initial surveys of the Earth's subsurface are done by seismic, which is acoustic waves, and it has very poor resolution. So think about Google Maps. Everybody knows every square inch of the entire Earth, but two inches below, we know nothing, practically nothing. And we're trying to figure out what's two or three or sometimes four miles below the surface of the Earth. And we only have resolution that's in tens if not hundreds of feet. So it's very hard to figure out where to go and what to do, where's the oil, and how do you specifically get to it. And I want to talk about how the, some of the things that are leading edges of that. And in fact, I saw today some really great examples of people who are d definitely thinking about that. While we're drilling, we make a lot of measurements. So I'll talk to you about some of the sensing technologies that we use right now. And then lastly, talk about the limitations on materials. Um, there, there are still inventions to be done in material science that are limitations to all of our ability to do a better job. And by better, I mean lower cost and higher productivity. And if you think about what those two terms mean, that means safer, more efficient, more carbon footprint efficient as, as an entire industry. And it's, a, it's an imperative. We know it, and we have to do that. So there's been a lot of talk today since I'm here at Penn that, about, gee, how do we engage as, as uh, you know, I'm a company. The, uh, the blue circle is oil companies. I'm the sort of the greenish yellow thing. And you are one of the other entities that I firmly believe we have to engage to solve the problems. It's uh, a long time ago people believed that companies solve their own problems. We can't do that anymore. These are very complicated problems that take multi-party, not just multi-individual uh, teams, but multi-parties to solve. And we firmly believe that the best solutions will come from an aggregation of these other entities along with us and our customers who are the oil companies. So it's, uh, it's a very complicated ecosystem, but it's a tremendous opportunity for sponsored research, for long-term relationships, for solving the pernicious problems that make energy uh, extraction uh, what it is, but it still has to get more efficient. So when I talk about digitization, when you think about how much information is being generated, this is just sort of worldwide inf information generation. And oh, I did put the, uh, that's from a Wells Fargo uh, study. But when you think about where are we going to be just in a very short few years, let's see, 163 zettabytes is, that's a zettabyte is 1,000 exabytes, which is 1,000 petabytes, which is 1,000 terabytes generated. So who's going to read all of that and figure out what it means? It's daunting, and it's going, it's running away from us. So we have to actually figure out how to do some, a couple things that I think are the important activities that we'll collectively need to get at. Now, if I boil that down specifically to drilling, drilling oil wells, when we're drilling an oil well, we generate about a terabyte of information a day. When we're producing an oil well, we generate about a half a terabyte a day per well. In the United States today, there's about a thousand wells being drilled. So there's 1,000 terabytes of information just in oil well drilling being generated every day. So um, I wanted to be able to explain to my management what is a terabyte. So if you do a little quick calculation, a terabyte is about the same as all of the information in all of Shakespeare's 38 plays. So every oil well is writing 38 Shakespeare plays a day. So this says something to me. What it said to me was, well, 
my wife, who's an English literature major, could say something about that to me. But I'm not really a Shakespeare guy. But I do know it's a lot of information. And could I read all 38 Shakespeare plays in a day, understand what it means, and then take corrective or control actions based on that collection of information? The answer is no. Humans aren't going to participate in the way we actually do the execution of oil well drilling. Planning, yes, but the execution, no. And as you can see, there's, there's a lot of wells. There's 2,000 wells being drilled, roughly, in real time today. And there are a million wells on Earth producing today. So there's a million times half a terabyte of information being generated. And nobody's using it. And yet, we, we, we're going to have to get at the use of this information, and more likely in real time. So we think about the digitization cycle as, here's the objective function. So we have to operate to get higher productivity, lower cost, more efficiency, safer, and more environmental operations. And we have to do that in real time. And we've, we've been thinking about this in two domains. One is the physical domain and the other is the virtual domain. So above the red, is it red line? Yeah. Above the red line is the, the real domain. And if we start with uh, measurement, oh, the pointer doesn't really work. If we start with measurement, the idea is there's a lot of things we have to measure while we're drilling an oil well or producing an oil well. It generates, I just told you how much information it generates. We have to curate the data. So the minute you decide you're going to collect that much information. The analysis part of the acronym is that we have to figure out which part is data and which part is just simply information. We do nuclear magnetic resonance on the rocks downhole in real time on a drill well string. That may seem really non-intuitive to you. MRI, the same thing that you get when you go to the hospital. And that generates not only a terabyte a day, but the noise to signal ratio of NMR is 10 to the ninth. So for every billion pieces of information we collect, only one is actually data that we can use. And we have to curate that on the tool. We have to calculate what the data actually tells us about the result in real time. Now, once you have the result, you need to be able to compare it to a simulation model to see how it comports. Is the, if you presume the data is right and the model is uh, telling you something else, then you can make a control action. So that takes you back into the virtual reality, or the, the, sorry, the real world, the hard world, where we can make a control action on a machine. And I'll show you some of the machines that we make. The other thing that's starting to worry me a little bit is that suppose the model's wrong and the data is right. So if the data is correct and you, you think the machine is off course and you want to make a correction because your model is right, that's easy. But if the data is correct and your model is not, then we have to start creating models that deviate further and further from the physics, the known physics of the situation. In other words, we're going to have models that don't necessarily rely on physics. They rely on actually what just happened here. And that's going to take us into the realm of machine learning. And we had a good discussion about that this morning. Neural networks, artificial intelligence, about letting our machines run themselves and change their models as they need to. Again, humans are not going to be able to do this in real time. So by taking humans out of the loop, we're actually going to make things faster, cheaper, more effective, more consistent. Humans make mistakes. They take breaks. There's a bias between shift changes, which is one of the realities of the world. Person B comes on. We have, in one of our sites, we have our own drilling site. And we have one driller, a guy named Freddie. And he won't follow the plan. So we don't like it when Freddie comes on. But we do get to see the bias of how he behaves relative to the machinery whilst it's being operated. And then the other guy, I can't remember his name, uh, does exactly what we're told, follows the well plan. So I'll show you an example of following the well plan by a machine. So now in sensing, when you're drilling, you're six miles away from the surface and you don't have anything to look at. What we do is we make a whole suite of measurements that 
MRI is one, nuclear magnetic resonance, gamma rays, neutrons, but one of the acoustic, one of the mainstays is electromagnetic. And we look at resistivity, and it's really just simply that. It's resistivity, and the more fluid that's out in the reservoir, the lower the resistivity. The more rock, the higher the resistivity. So this is the next generation of tool where while we're running the tool, so this tool is going um, two to 400 RPM. It's being shocked by somewhere between one to 10 Gs continuously because it's vibrating inside of a rock tunnel we just created. And we measure out now 200 feet with a little less than a foot resolution so that we know the actual reservoir that we're in. Remember, the initial estimate of what reservoir you're in and why you're drilling to a particular place only has a resolution of, say, 30 feet. Some of the U.S. shale in western Texas, where we're trying to drill for gas, the, uh, the entire producing field is shorter than the height of this room. And if your resolution is only the height of this room, your chance of actually getting into it with only that information is not very good. So what, we learned, what we've learned to do is measure while we're there and make all our corrections in the tool autonomously while we're there. And that's an important distinction because the information about the reservoir is not complete until you've actually drilled the entire well. So it's a bit of a daunting task. So this is um, our previous generation of this could go 18 feet. So now we can look pretty far uh, away from the drill and that tells us a lot about where we want to fracture and how we want to, you've heard about hydraulic fracturing, where we want to fracture and to what extent we want to fracture, how far away from the well bore we want to fracture. This is a real-time map that's produced in, uh, so this is, we're, we're solving Maxwell's equations on the tool in real time on a computer that's run by batteries. So it sounds a little bit crazy, but we're using NVIDIA gaming chips. So we do all our computations with game hardware. And to do this solution, I, so I was afraid there were differential equations on the board. I was really worried I would have to explain them because I've forgotten all my differential equations. But we have this humongous matrix. You get all this information. You have a big matrix that you have to invert to figure out what the answer is. What's, what's the resistivity turn into the lithology? And we can do it now in real time, just in one dimension, because we don't have enough power to do two dimensions at a time. So we do one dimension up and down. Then we subsequently do a dimension sideways. We can do that in real time on the tool. And the next generation, if any of you would like to if you're very interested in this kind of thing, is to do three dimensions real time on the tool. So equivalent, it's equivalent of having either a supercomputer on the tool or you're going to have to help us figure out what are the shortcut ways to do the matrix inversion to get full three-dimensional information. It's very important to know where you're drilling a hole. You want to stay in the oil, you want to stay away from water, and you want to stay away from faults, of which there are many. So this is a very important advancement in the measurements that we're actually making on the tool down hole in real time. And it's again, it's a very harsh environment. Think about, um, sounds like a pretty interesting measurement to make. It's an electrical resistivity. But imagine 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Imagine 25,000 PSI. And the machine that you've built to do this might be in a fluid that's saturated with CO2, an aqueous fluid, or saturated with hydrogen sulfide. And so that shortens, shortens up the life of the machinery substantially. So you have to think a lot about, there's a lot of mechanical engineering that goes into this. It's not just people solving Maxwell's equations, but it's mechanical engineering. Here's another measurement that uh, is part of, part of our example of thinking about how do we get outside the kinds of technology we've historically used in oil and gas? We've always wanted to make direct measurements. So the electromagnetic measurement that I just mentioned is inferential. You're not measuring the fluid content directly. This is a direct measurement, and we decided that we wanted to do spectroscopy down hole. So remember, let me remind you the conditions. You're in an eight inch diameter hole, it's 400 degrees Fahrenheit, 25,000 PSI, and you're in some kind of goopy liquid and you want to do spectroscopy. So, less, you know, so 
This desk would very nicely hold, uh, you know, a white light spectrometer, infrared spectrometer, ultraviolet spectrometer. It also takes a PhD to sort of run it and caretake it. We have to do it in an eight inch diameter envelope. So we went around the world looking for who's doing spectroscopy. And a big part of spectroscopy isn't the absorption where you shine light through a sample, which is shown here, you shine white light, we're using white light, through a cuvette, a flow cuvette in a sample holder inside the drill. And, uh, and then we shine it through an optical filter. And the optical filter is a computer. And we've set, set this up, or we actually bought this technology, so that uh, each one optical filter would give us a scalar of the component intensity for one, uh, one optical computer for one component. So what we did was we put all those little colored dots. Each one of those is an optical computer. And it sits on the back side of a flow cuvette. Light goes through, through the sample in the cuvette, goes through these optical computers, turns the, the absorption spectrum into a scalar, and it tells us the concentration of one component. And so what we do is, in a very simple way, we spin that wheel. So we spin the wheel around, and it gives us the kinds of results that you see on that chart on the right, laboratory results versus downhole results. And it's parity. Uh, it's cheating a little bit. It's a log-log scale. But so I reckon you'd call me on it, so I'll tell you about it anyway. But so you, the point is, it's very hard to do laboratory quality work in this downhole environment. But we actually are directly measuring components in real time downhole. So now when we're drilling, we can actually tell the oil company what's there. In the past, the way this was done, a sample was taken, put into a sample bomb, shipped off to a lab, analyzed in an analytical laboratory. If something didn't go wrong, if the sample wasn't lost or the pressure wasn't op opened prematurely and the sample discharged, uh, you would find out what was in the well that you drilled four months ago. Now we're telling people, now, real time, because this is done on what's called a wireline, which is, has a direct communication, fiber optic communication to the surface. So that sounds very interesting. But one of the really most important things about this technology is where we got it. We got this from the dog food industry. So we found a company in South Carolina that was measuring impurities in dog food for, I think it was Alpo. And they had invented this new kind of spectroscopy. And we had a group of right-brained people scouring the world to figure out how to make direct measurements of components in oil wells in real time. And they brought us to the dog food industry. So now it wasn't exactly ready. It took us three years. I think we spent um, probably 50 to 100 million dollars. But we also got 300 patents on this particular device and its embodiment over the course of three to four years. And now this is the standard for measuring componentry in oil wells in real time. So it didn't come from anybody in oil and gas. We made it robust. We put it into the tool. But if you're in the dog food industry, you could just as well work in the oil and gas industry. So this is a cute marketing picture of the next generation of what we're doing with drilling. So it's a little bit, uh, well, Exaggerated, I guess I'd say. Um, but what we're thinking about right now is when you're drilling an oil well and you're generating all this information, in today's world, there is a person in a cabin at the top of the oil well who's got about two joystick sticks and three knobs. And they're trying to figure out how to follow a trajectory and get the, uh, the drill bit and the the well bore placed where we wanted to place it, at least where the well plan was projecting to put it. And they actually have a little tablet of paper, and they do some rudimentary calculations with a pencil to try to make all the corrections they need to make while they're drilling, because they get feedback on things like torque and how much weight is on the bit and how much resistance they're getting and how much vibration is occurring. And we've decided to eliminate the human thought process and the little tablet of paper with this algorithm here, actually Manfred Morari was a big part of helping us develop this 
this algorithm that take the human out. So he's been on our team of people who've been working on uh, automated drilling. And we've created a device that has a new kind of steering system. So actually, you have to steer a drill bit when it's down there, and you have to steer it at the bit. And it's called push the bit. So you have a little set of flippers that flip out to push the bit against the rock to go to the other direction. So you push on one side, and it goes in the other direction. And without going into the details of this, it's, I mean, what's really important is that in this day of information collection, accuracy matters, getting in the right zone matters, being safe and efficient matters, and humans just aren't going to do it. So that's not a very clear picture, but I'll show you in the next chart. Um, but this is a typical dashboard. There's a lot of information. So if you're the person in the drilling cabin and you don't know any calculus, I admit mine's rusty, but at least I know some, that uh, the person in the drilling cabin doesn't know any calculus, doesn't know any of the physics of what's going on. They just have experiential learning, and they're confronted with a database that looks like this that's changing every second, and they have to respond to it. It can't be done with humans. So here's, oops, I, th I, I guess I must have missed a chart. I had a chart where I was actually showing the automation of, of, uh, of the drilling. Maybe it's later in the deck. So from uh, this digitization notion, let me talk a little bit about, and, and sensing, talk a little bit about the formation. Here's a citation from a professor at the University of Wyoming, Mohammed Piri. And we've been looking at uh, why hydrocarbons sequester themselves in reservoirs and why, they, and, uh, and we're, and why not. So he, we've been looking at some uh, x-ray tomography and this, this particular slide is a representation of, in the bottom right photograph, the left side panel of that is a water wet simulated reservoir. And we were flowing fluid through this simulated reservoir. This is a sponsored research program we do with him. And all of a sudden, it flipped to oil wet. And when that happens, if that happens in a real reservoir, that's the end of production. So, because once the oil wets out on the surface, it's not going anywhere, anywhere. It's, it's stuck. And if you don't know, the, the amount of oil that we recover from uh, uh, unconventional shales, as people call them, in North America is 8%. So 92% of the hydrocarbons are left behind. We only collect 8%. In traditional reservoirs, that number is about 30%. Still, we're leaving. 70% uh, of the hydrocarbons behind. So if you think about it, this is a very important problem to solve and to understand why this happens and what we can do to mitigate this. This probably is happening, else, else why would only 8% come out? So think about the last 100 years, a trillion barrels of oil have been, have been generated, and we've only collected 30% of what's actually down there. So there's actually two more trillion barrels down there in wells that have already been drilled. So we don't even actually have to drill any more wells if we figure out why reservoir behavior does this. This is a very active area. There are a lot of people working on this right now. And it's an important, it's not just a flow problem. I think there's kind of a, therm, Eduardo and I were talking about last night, it's a thermodynamics problem. So maybe we'll have to pull him back out of retirement and get him to help me figure out the thermodynamics. But just for reference, uh, we don't know anything about the PVT conditions of the materials at 400 Fahrenheit and 25,000 PSI. Nobody's done any PVT of hydrocarbons at those conditions. So we don't even know what, uh, what phase is, is down there. My guess is, I, as you would probably all guess, probably has to be supercritical. But at some point, when you go from the highest pressure and the highest temperature at the farthest reaches of an oil well to the surface, where it's at room temperature and pressure, something changes. And where does that change? Why does it change? And is that part of the behavior that keeps us from getting all the hydrocarbons out? So we can think of physical methodologies to try to get more out, or chemical methodologies to try to get more out. So it's an important problem for us, because I'd rather drill less oil wells. And probably most people in the world would rather we drill less oil wells. The oil is there. Let's take it out. We need it. Here's another interesting technology that we've brought in from the outside, 
and it's a material, it's a really interesting materials problem, and that is uh, we often put things called plugs down in an oil well. So sometimes you want to put a stopper in the pipe at a certain distance down the pipe. So you can put a really high pressure above the stopper, and that's how we do hydraulic fracturing, where we put really, really high pressures on the pipe. We punctuate, uh, perforate the pipe and, and then pump fluid through it. And uh, historically, people have put metallic plugs down these, these holes to create a stopper. And then we went to composite. And now we've gone to dissolvable plugs. So we put a plug down hole, and we tailor the chemistry of the metallurgy of the plug so that it dissolves in a certain amount of time in a certain ionic environment. And uh, so we can tailor the, the time as a response to ionic strength. It's an aqueous environment that it sits in. And um, it's not really dissolving. So we got this from people who were battery chemists. So we hired some people who came from the, that part of the energy industry. And this is a galvanic cell. And it's timed to disappear from being a plug. Once it, once it breaks up into all these little pieces, it just rattles down to the bottom of the well. And then we can proceed with other sections of producing. So just for reference, this is something that never would have come out of the oil and gas industry. This, these are people who were thinking about batteries. And we figured out that might be a pretty good idea for us. This thing, since the moment we're on our fifth generation of this, and it has displaced all the other conventional methods of doing this in about three years. Nobody puts solid plugs down anymore unless they dissolve. That way, there's many less operations, dangerous operations, where you have to go in with a drill to drill out the plug to get it out of the way. So fantastic solution that didn't come from oil and gas. Now, a couple more things that are a little further out. Um, we're trying to figure out how to avoid using synthetic organic polymers for creating thixotropy. So we, we, we like having special properties of fluids. We like it when fluids have a yield stress, because there are times we want to stop the flow and also prevent backflow, prevent material from moving. So, a, so having a yield stress in a fluid is, is a very interesting thing. And of course, we can, you all know that we can do that with polymers. It's not that hard to do. But synthetic organic polymers in an oil well, you're pumping gigantic volumes of materials. And it becomes expensive, even for the cheapest polymers. So we tried to look at natural polymers. And the two polymers that we closed in on here were chitin, which comes from shrimp shells, and cellulose from trees. Oh, thank God that's not my phone. <laughs> oh, Eduardo's the only one that's allowed to do that. <laughs> it's OK. <clears throat> Warren's the other one that's allowed to do it. Anyway, so what we, the interesting thing that we found is, so in these two uh, families of curves on that right panel, left panel, sorry, my right, is uh, the synthetic organic polymers lose their viscosity holding capability at lower temperatures. And chitin, think about it, chitin and cellulose, they don't. When's the last time you cooked shrimp? What happens to the shells? Nothing. Shrimp shells are incredibly resistant to degradation and hydrolysis in particular. And so we've been, we're still experimenting with this. This is a long putt to get this to be a replacement for, for materials that the oil companies have been using for decades and decades and decades. But this is an opportunity for us to use materials that are either waste, they're ubiquitous, they're cheap, and we, we you know, don't have to worry about, I, 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 would, I was sort of hoping I'd get the day when I could have a discussion with Greenpeace and I was telling them I was pumping shrimp shells down hole. That would be a hard argument for them to have with me. So we're still working on that. We're not there yet. But I think there's a tremendous opportunity for whole families of natural materials to be considered for use in this industry. It's got to get cleaner. It's got to get greener. We know that. And these are the kinds of things that we can do. And here's another technology that we took from the pharmaceutical industry. So everybody's familiar with those little tiny contact bead capsules, capsules that dissolve, all kinds of things that dissolve 
in medicines that you take today. Time release. And we wanted to apply time release to a couple families of problems. One is acidification. So in, sometimes in reservoirs, the pores get plugged up, and they get plugged up with minerals. And the way you open the pores, again, to let the oil flow is you dissolve the rock with acid, just simple mineral acid. And now, to deliver a bolus of mineral acid six miles away in a tube that's eight inches in diameter, uh, you can, I never calculated the volume. It's a lot of acid. And while you're doing that, you have to push this acid through your pumps, through all the pipes that you have on the surface, and all the pipes that go down all the way to the place where you want to perform an acidification. And that basically is corroding everything along the way. It's absolutely everything. So what we wanted to do was put time release capsules with a very small amount of acid that's easy to handle on the surface and pump that down hole and have it time release to release the acid at the place we wanted to do it, at the time we wanted to do it, and in the smallest amount possible. Think about it. We don't want to expose people to acid. We don't want to have acid spills on the ground. And uh, so now on the upper right panels, the two photographs, uh, people tried glass spheres. It's very compelling because glass spheres are very robust. Uh, they're really, really robust on the surface, but when you put them through a centrifugal pump or even a positive displacement pump, they break. And there you see what happens to them. It doesn't take very much pressure to cause a, uh, a glass sphere to break. We decided that we could encapsulate them inside a polymer gel bead. And we could put the, the acid, you see the structure over there, and putting acid into a dissolvable gel bead, which you can handle on the surface, and pump down hole. It has, uh, you can tell the molecular weight, so it dissolves at the time you want it to dissolve, and have the acid released, a very small amount of acid at the rock face, so it just does the function you want and doesn't harm people on the surface. People on the surface could handle it like powder without any. I actually gave some of this to our chairman, who gave a talk somewhere. Uh, we took the acid out. I gave it to him, and uh, he decided he was going to do a really funny trick, because these are very, very small particles, almost the size of talc. And he was going to put some in his hand and blow it out into the audience, just to prove that it's safe and all this stuff. And I said, I gave him one caution. I said, these are very small particles. Um, before you bring your mouth up to blow this little handful of stuff, Take your breath in before you get your mouth near your hand so you're not inspiring these particles. It would be not so good. We didn't put the acid in. We always give him the benign version of things so he doesn't kill himself in public. Um, anyway, you see kinetics. We understand the kinetics really well. We can tailor the kinetics for how long it takes these things to dissolve. And then there's one more family of things that are pharma-inspired that we've been looking at, and that is uh, performing time-release reactions inside particles. So this is even harder. This is actually quite difficult to do. We haven't commercialized this yet because we're still concerned about how we can make this safe for, for humans. But um, ultimately, we, should be, we want to be able to do reactions in very small particles so that when we pump particles out into the rock formations, we want to know where the particles, the so-called propin particles, the things that hold the rocks apart, which allow us to produce oil, um, where those particles go. So we've been trying to get reactive particles that actually make noise when they react at a time of our choosing. So it's a two-component. We also have some three-component dissolvable structures where when they dissolve, a very rapid reaction occurs and it makes a pop. It's like a very small firecracker. And when that happens, we can listen to it on fiber optics downhole, and we can tell where the, the particle got, uh, and we can tell, in some cases, when it got there. So it's really important in oil wells, if you're going to do hydraulic fracturing, where you're going to break the rocks, you need to make sure you know where you're, where you're breaking the rocks and where you're not breaking the rocks. You can't be breaking into uh, any aquifers, even though these aren't potable aquifers. 10,000 feet below the surface is not potable, but um, we still, it's just not a good idea. You want to get into oil zones only. And so the next generation after just a single component to solution is multi-component reaction-bearing particles the size of a, smaller than a grain of sand. 
And again, the thing that we're most concerned about that right now is making sure that it doesn't react while it's around people above the surface of the Earth. So we're still trying to figure that out. Anyway, I had, I had concluded that I could, I had so many more examples, but I didn't really want to take any more of your time. I would love to, and certainly at the reception we can talk about a couple other things. But um, just to summarize, it, it could be a really long time until we're done with hydrocarbons. And uh, at lunch I was talking to Eric. So if you think about how long we could go without hydrocarbons, think about this. The U.S. Strategic Petroleum Reserve is uh, 30 days. India's Strategic Petroleum Reserve is seven days. So if India somehow or other got embargoed from getting oil, they have very little oil of their own, if they got embargoed from having oil in seven days, India would be without electricity. The United States, if that happened, which is not likely, would be 30 days. So the world supply of oil, if you stopped, and there are a lot of people that say stop drilling now. It's not really a good idea because in 30 days all the lights will be out. So we're, gonna, we're in a transition period, it's very clear. It could be a really long time, and in the interim, we have to do a better job. There's no question about it. It has to be more efficient. Efficiency will drive safety. It drives environmental soundness. And those are, those are really um, priorities for us. And I think for those of you in the audience, if you think you're really far away from being a thinker in the oil and gas industry, think again. Because we have batteries, we have dog food, we have pharmaceuticals, and there's many, many other fields of people that are participating in this ecosystem to help us improve, make things much more effective, cost effective, safety effective, environmentally effective, at uh, practically, you know, there's research cost, but we like the cost, the actual cost of the work to go down. And as far as I'm concerned, the ideas should be coming from anywhere and everywhere. So just because you're here on the Atlantic Ocean doesn't mean you can't work in oil and gas in Houston, Texas, where it doesn't snow very much. <laughs> anyway, with that, if, I mean, if, I don't know if you typically want to have questions and answers or... But I thought I'd leave time if you had a little Q&A, or certainly at the, at the next session we can have a quick chat if you like. Happy to talk about anything you like.